Hello and welcome to this International Conference on Men's Issues 2020 Special Edition of Gender Matters with your hosts, me, Elizabeth Hobson and Mike Buchanan, leader and founder, respectively, of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. We bring a wonderful guest to you today, Dr. Jules Gomez. Jules has a PhD from the University of Cambridge and is now producer and Rome correspondent for Church Militant, one of the biggest Catholic media companies in the world. Jules is a man of erudition, intellect and ethics, as well as faith. We shall be discussing the modern taboo subject of abortion. Welcome, Jules. Well, thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. Uh, your description of me humbles me hugely. And uh, it, it's an absolute delight to be on this program, but it's also a delight to have known you and Mike and the movement uh, that you have spawned, have founded over the last uh, many years. And it, it, it is truly a joy. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you for hosting this conference. Jules, thank you. I, I'm not sure that we could claim to have launched the movement. I think uh, I think we get shot if we if we claim that. <laughs> but but, 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 but th thanks, thank you for the sentiment. And uh, something something that we'll do is is put a link to the um, to the to, to a video of the talk you gave in 2018 in London, which was very memorable, and um, had, had a lot of lot of uh, created a lot of interest. So so we'll we'll post a link to that. So welcome, and thank you for joining us, Jules. Now, um, Elizabeth and I are not religious, but we are pro-life, a position often associated in popular imagination with religion, and more specifically, Christianity and Catholicism. Are there, are there also good non-religious arguments against abortion, do you think? Uh, absolutely, Mike. One of my bugbears has been constantly telling Christians uh, Catholics and evangelicals, uh, not to use the argument from authority when speaking about abortion, particularly to pro-abortionists. I advise Christians not to use the Bible or to use Catholic teaching, authoritative Catholic teaching, uh, to defend their pro-life position when engaging with pro-abortionists. And if you are a religious person, or if you would like some sort of Christian foundation for a pro-life position, most certainly you have it. You have it in Genesis chapter one, where God creates all human beings in his image and likeness, endowing all of us with a profound dignity. You have it in Psalm 139, for example, where in glorious sublime poetry, uh, the, the, the poet talks, sings about how God knew him even when he was in his mother's womb and intricately created him and fashioned his inward parts. Uh, then there is also the uh, wonderful quote from Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah chapter one, uh, when you were, when I was in my mother's womb, you knew me and called me. And then that wonderful passage uh, in Luke's gospel where, Jesus, uh, where Elizabeth and Mary meet and the babe leaps in, John the Baptist leaps in Mary's womb for joy. Uh, Catholics can also quote the catechism and Catholic teaching that calls abortion an intrinsic evil. This is a word that I'm slowly becoming familiar with. It, it's, it's fairly new in my own vocabulary, but what fascinates me about this word intrinsic evil is that it is an evil that cannot be justified under any circumstances. And of course, let me be specific, we are talking about elective abortion here. We are not talking about therapeutic abortion when the li mother's life is in danger. So uh, having, having uh, introduced this kind of Christian background, uh, let me very specifically answer your question now. And yes, emphatically yes, uh, people of no faith, people of goodwill who are atheists or agnostic or secular minded have terrific arguments against abortion, terrific pro-life uh, arguments, both scientific and philosophical. So scientifically, it can be argued that the unborn are distinct 
living and whole human beings. I've chosen those words very carefully. The unborn are distinct, living, and whole human beings. The science of embryology is clear. Embryos are human beings in the earliest stages of their natural development, and they dif differ from more mature species of the more mature members of, of human beings, not in virtue of the kind of thing they are, like a cat would differ from a tree, but only in their degree of development. Uh, scientifically, a zygote is what embryologists call a totipotent cell, a complete cell, and under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. Philosophically, it can be argued that none of the differences between the embryo I once was and the adult I now am justify killing me at that earlier stage of development. So these differences, size, level of development, location, and degree of dependency, quickly elaborate on those. Just because someone is smaller, much, much smaller than you, it doesn't mean you can murder that person. Just because someone is much less developed than a fully human, fully grown adult, it doesn't justify you killing it. Just because someone is protected or enclosed in a particular location or an environment like his or her mother's womb, it doesn't make that person any less of a human being. Uh, similarly, just because someone is dependent on a life support machine or receives kidney dialysis or regular blood transfusion, it doesn't justify the taking of their life. So both scientifically and philosophically, abortion is immoral. It doesn't depend on how tiny you are, where you are, how inconvenient your existence is, or how dependent you are on someone else. You are a human being, and people of faith would say, you are made in the image and likeness of God. Can I just say this? What inspired me was uh, I... Atheist pro-life lady, a uh, campaigner, pro-life campaigner in London. And she campaigns outside one of these Marie Stoves clinics. And I was very surprised that she was an atheist, but not uh, shocked because I have seen pro-life atheist organizations on the internet. And I asked her what led her to this pro-life position. And she told me that her pro-life position was the logical consequence of her own prior position on ethical veganism. She opposes the killing of animals and their commodification, and there was no way she could continue to support the killing of unborn babies. Jules, thank you, that's fascinating. W would you be able to point us in that lady's direction? I, th I think, I think that, that, that could possibly make for a fascinating conference video um, on, on its own. I'll definitely do that. I'll send you a picture of hers as well, which I've used in a couple of my stories. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we also covered the issue of abortion yesterday in one of our two interviews with Warren Farrell. And he had some absolutely fascinating perspectives on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, so we look forward, you know, we, we look forward to the responses to those. And Elizabeth, it's over to you. Thank you. Well, something that occurs to me in this debate is that while we know that more women than men are pro-life and that there are women who regret their abortions, feminism has a stranglehold on the debate which discounts the voices of so many women. So why is there this monumental double standard of turning a blind eye to women who oppose abortion or regret theirs and often actually insisting that if you are a feminist you must support abortion? Uh, the, the simple answer, Elizabeth, as you and I and other members of our organization know only too well, the simple answer is because the current wave of feminism is not about defending vulnerable women. It's not about equal rights for women. It is about the destruction of the so-called patriarchy. It is about a deep and irrational hatred for men. 
It is also about upholding the doctrine of intersectionality, the doctrine that has come as a result of cultural Marxism. And it is about keeping women, uh, i.e. feminists, on the top of the ladder of, victim, of victimhood. So in a sense, it's about power. And uh, the father of postmodernism, Michel Foucault, only too wonderfully, and of course, a long time ago before that, Nietzsche reminds us of power and, and the, the games people play use because they want to maintain their stranglehold on power. So, so, so this is what, what is the goal of feminists. And what feminism does to avoid confronting the real great intrinsic evil of abortion is that feminism creates made up evils. So uh, sexist language, uh, Pope Francis, who I don't really support a lot because of uh, many of his uh, Marxist positions as it were, uh, because he's not really teaching the Catholic faith in many instances, uh, but Pope Francis's most recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti uh, entitled All Brothers, uh, which is based on the words of St. Francis of Assisi, has come in for a bit of a storm from feminists because they claim that his title is not gender inclusive. It excludes women. Now, and of course, they don't even know uh, Italian because Fratelli, uh, when addressed to a mixed gender crowd, you know, grammatically includes women. So, uh, but they have made such a big noise about this. So, so you can see where their attention is focused. Sexist language is a great evil. The gender pay gap is a huge evil. Uh, and so when confronted with these made up evils, they don't really want to see real evil like millions of baby girls aborted in India because their parents want a male child because of a whole range of Hindu uh, ideas. I, and I've written about this, this fairly extensively, but this is uh, one of India's biggest problems today. And where are the feminists jumping up and down to defend the sanctity of girls who are being slaughtered on a genocidal scale? Uh, or for that matter, bride burning in India, such a major problem. Western feminists completely ignore that and, and uh, rail and rant about sexist language or women who are truly oppressed in Islamic societies. Where is the righteous indignation about that? Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I was in church and uh, I met two Polish girls after mass. And it was interesting to see them come into this church because we go to a Byzantine rite congregation where the service is in Greek, Arabic, and Italian. It's rather strange. And uh, we, we got talking to them. And uh, this girl, and then we, we asked this lady, how are things in Poland? And she said, I hate Poland. I said, Why? We've heard wonderful things coming out from Poland, particularly under Andrzej Duda. And she said, uh, uh, because I can't make progress. And I said, what sort of progress do you want to make? Well, I'm a structural engineer and I would also like to get into the environment. And I do not have a female role model to help me to grow in this, in this area. And we, we, we literally looked stunned and we said, this is one of the freest countries. I don't feel free, she said. So I said, are there laws? Is there anything structural that is holding you back as a woman from becoming a structural engineer who will also excel at protecting the environment? And she said, no. And then we started talking to her about situations, for example, in India, where the oppression of women in some, some circumstances, not all, is, is hugely problematic. And her jaw just dropped because she knew that her arguments were really stupid. So this is the kind of, you know, uh, this is leftism. It's all about creating made up evils so that people will not notice a real evil. And then the people who have made up these evils will be left free. 
to themselves perpetrate these great evils. Mm -hmm. So feminism is about resetting your moral compass. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you explore this question more deeply, and I, you know, you, you know much more about this than I do, you have asked a very profound question. Uh, and the answer to that is that feminism has turned out to be woman's greatest betrayer. Christina Hoff Summers in a great book, Who Stole Feminism? How Women Had Betrayed Women, says it so wonderfully. Uh, let me, by the way, also say this, that feminists want everyone to support abortion because abortion is the great sacrament of feminism. What the body and blood of Jesus is in the, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist to a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox Christian, abortion is to feminism. Uh, my boss, Michael Voris at uh, Church Militant keeps saying this relentlessly. He says, the whole fracture in the United States, the whole hatred for Trump is all about abortion. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I think he's right. Uh, and it's feminists themselves who say this. Jeanette Paris has written a book called The Sacrament of Abortion. And she agrees. She's a feminist who calls for abortion as a sacrament. Uh, feminism is a religion. One of the best things that happened to me when I came to your conference a couple of years ago was meeting Janice Fearmenger, Professor Janice Fearmenger. She's absolutely brilliant. And she's written an article for my website uh, that talks about how feminism is a religion because it has its own doctrines of creation, of the fall, of sin, of redemption. It is an alternative religion. That's a really interesting point that I've never considered. But, you know, um, I, I've, I've read about cults. And I learned that in cults, the cults that last the longest are the ones that um, require the most sacrifice from the members. Right. Because once a member has given so much, they're really reluctant to throw away, you know, their membership. Yes. And so, you know, once a woman has killed her own child, right. how can she possibly leave feminism? Wow, that is huge wow gosh thank you for sharing that yeah um just like just a couple of quick things here jules um the problem of um uh, disproportionately more female than male um abortions of course is is down to is also very prevalent in china yes absolutely. Or, or, or certainly was under the one one child yeah. policy yes um absolutely tragic um and I completely agree with you. And Elizabeth, I know, has written on this. Uh, there's no doubt that feminism is, 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 you know, is to its adherence a, a religion. Mm. Um, but if you compare it with, with, let's say, Christianity or, in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the major world religions, um, it has none of the upsides and all of the downsides. Yeah. Just yeah. There, there are no upsides. It's been toxic. It's been toxic. Yeah, exactly. well, yeah and that, that young woman that you spoke to, just sort of says it all doesn't it because you know feminism she's she's a capable intelligent able woman mm. yet feminism has made her bitter and neurotic and <laughs> unable yes. to fulfill yes. her destiny yes although you know perhaps you may you and your wife may have given her the key to unlock her potential well we, we certainly succeeded in putting a little pebble in her shoe mm. Uh, and, and what you say is so right, because she came with her friend, and her friend was so joyful and also Polish, uh, a medical doctor, and she never expressed any difficulty about, you know, climbing the ladder or succeeding in life, and she was joyful and bubbly and vibrant, and uh, this lady was so miserable, and I have lots of Polish friends, and in, in, interestingly, most of them are not feminist, and uh, the women or the men, and, and that, they're just so happy and full of life and, you know, <laughs> particularly at weddings I've experienced. <laughs> Jules, since the Abortion Act of 1967, over 10 million unborn children have been killed in the UK, mainly at the expense of male taxpayers. 53 years after the Act was passed, with access to near infallible contraception, mm. British women continue to kill about 200,000 unborn children every year. To 
to what extent do you think the collective loss of faith in the Western civilization sustains this relentless Holocaust? I can answer that question fairly briefly, actually. Uh, I think it's central to it. Um, as, as a biblical scholar, I go back to the book of Deuteronomy uh, and uh, look at Moses when the children of Israel uh, entered the promised land. And he gives this great uh, sermon. And the end of the sermon is a call to choose life or choose death. And you choose life for yourself and for your children when you know that you're living in a society that is positive, a society where there is the possible, a good society where you can have a good life. And people all around the world have looked to the West, wanted to immigrate to the West because the West has been good for many people. Uh, leftism, of course, colors the West as bad and oppressive. And if feminism has continued to peddle this toxic message and people believe that we are living in a toxic environment, why will they choose life? Why will they continue? I mean, there's nothing good about Western civilization. We are living in a horrible country. That's what people believe. Patriarchy, slavery, racism, capitalism. These are all great evils. We are oppressed. Uh, why on earth would I want to throw away my contraceptive mentality and have children and bring children into this world. You know, I can enjoy uh, sex without any consequence. And so if the girl I'm sleeping with conceives, go and get an abortion. Uh, uh, and this, of course, as we all know, has its roots in the uh, 1925 uh, Frankfurt School with people like Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, Jürgen Habermas, etc., espousing critical theory. And the primary goal of critical theory was to destroy the West and the, the, the uh, ethos the moral and philosophical framework underpinning the whole of the West, which is Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian civilizations. And they've been very successful at that time. They've been very successful, yes, yes. You will multiply and fill the earth. If you think in the book of Genesis, again, if you look at the world as good, and that's what the Genesis text repeatedly says, all that God has created is good, nay, very good. But if the West is bad, you will build a tower of Babel and you will huddle together and form a totalitarian state where everyone speaks with one mind and one tongue and has the same ideology. No dissent is permitted and no children are necessary. <laughs> Thank you, Jules. I, um, I imagine that one day human beings will look back on us and wonder at the barbarity that led us to kill our children. Do you think that will happen? And if so, what do you think it will take to reach that point? Ah, that is a very difficult question to answer. I, I think it will require a profound hermen what I call a hermeneutical fracture. The realization primarily that what we are killing is a human being. If you want to kill another human being with impunity and with absolutely no residual effect on your conscience, you then de you first dehumanize the person. So the Jews, the Nazis had to dehumanize the Jews as cockroaches. Uh, and then they could kill them without any problem whatsoever. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, comment in Mark Twain. And uh, I, I, I forget the, the comment, but it's something to the effect of, yes, it's in Huckle the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And Huck makes up a story to Aunt Sally to explain his late arrival by boat. A cylinder head blew out. That's what it says. Anybody hurt? No, ma'am. Killed a N-I-G-G-E-R. Well, it's lucky because sometimes people do get hurt, Aunt Sally says. So the black person who has got killed, that person, he's not really a person because you see, sometimes people get killed. So the way to dehumanize black people into slavery was to dehumanize them. 
Oh, 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 you know, so, so, so people wouldn't feel anything. Uh, now, how do people begin to have this hermeneutical fracture, uh, this repentance, which in Greek is simply metanoia, a total change of mind? It, it, it's, I think, when they're, oh, yes, first, when they're confronted with the humanity, the full humanity of the baby, and how do you get them to do that? How do you confront then just how do you get them to see that? Well, what we do, Elizabeth, is we use images. And we've done this by looking at the history of social reform. So for example, uh, uh, William Wilberforce, primarily Thomas Clarkson, made an impact on the slave trade when he began to show sketches of how the slaves were brutalized and dehumanized on the slave ship Brook. And when people saw the image, they were so, they were incandescent with the image. You know, why are you showing us such things? We're using Jamaican sugar in our tea. Don't upset us by showing us the humanity of the slave. And uh, Lewis Hine, in his campaign to abolish child labor, uh, did the same thing, showed terrible pictures, photographs of boys going into the mines. And then you had Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement showing images of the white sheriff unleashing his huge dogs on the, the poor uh, black, uh, black people. And uh, what, what we do is we show massive, authentic medical images of the fetus the baby inside the mother's womb at different stages of its growth, and then videos of a baby being aborted, profoundly painful, cruel, barbaric, and uh, this is the dismemberment of a human being where his or her limbs are torn apart or the baby is poisoned, and then the residue, the parts are vacuum suctioned out of the mother's body. Uh, we've seen when people look at these images or look at a video, it doesn't matter whether they're Christians or atheists or agnostic, there is that hermeneutical fracture and they say, my goodness, I didn't know this is what, uh, this is what an abortion was all about. So uh, the left feminists talk about giving people an informed choice, but guess what? When we try to inform people, my goodness, the vitriol we have faced, why are you showing us images? Well, you, are, you have no problem with the actual act of dismembering a baby, but you're so upset because we are showing you pictures of this gruesome procedure yeah. in progress. And so, uh, I, I do believe that, that there will come a time when people will say that, well, this is what we did to slaves 100 years ago. This is what we did to little babies 3,000 years ago when we threw them into the fire as an act of worship to Moloch. Incidentally, Moloch's statue, that ancient uh, god, was uh, a huge statue of that god was displayed at the Colosseum in Rome a few months ago. I don't know why they did that, but hopefully it would remind people of people, you know, uh, mothers and fathers offering their babies to Moloch in child sacrifice, that the brass statue of Moloch would be heated and the little baby would be placed on Moloch's arms and the baby would literally sizzle to death. Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the, relig the liturgical musicians would play music very loud drums and all that to drown out the baby's screams. But is what is happening in Mari Stopes and uh, Planned Parenthood any different from what happened 3000 years ago? No, and I, you know, what I find so um, enraging is the fact you, like you say, you know, feminists talk about informed choice and yet they will try to protect women yeah. from seeing the reality of abortion. Okay. And, you know, you can read accounts from women who didn't know what was going to happen. And then they saw, you know, as it was being done to them, they saw their baby being torn to pieces, yeah. you know, and they're completely traumatized by it. Yes. It's terrible. 
Yes. I recall, I, I, I happen to have been in Dublin the day that the results of the Irish abortion referendum came in. And I've got to say that was a very depressing result. Oh, um, yeah. some, somebody, I think it may have been an American pro-life organization uh, came over before the um, referendum <clears throat> and they interviewed quite, quite a number of um, pro-life uh, uh, people, you know, young people in, in, in particular. Um, and, and then they showed them a, a video of an abortion and they said virtually without exception, every one of those people changed their mind. My goodness! Oh, so it goes back to your earlier point. It's the, the, the imagery. You know, it's, it's, you know, and feminists are all about, as you, you know, as you said, Elizabeth. You know, hiding this reality from women. Yes. And and and, and you know, and they, oh. so, so, so they cannot leave feminism because that would be just so traumatic. Mm. Mm. J- Jules, can you tell us um, about some of the ways that you and others are fighting abortion? Uh, well, it, it is basically about showing these images what we do is we go out on the streets and uh, it it doesn't require a big group of people if there are four or if there are six we've talked to the police we've arranged a time we've even put little boats at the side saying uh, disturbing imagery ahead or disturbing images ahead and uh, we've we've shown we've just stood silent with these banners massive banners and then if people have wanted to speak to us, we have engaged them using philosophical and scientific arguments, not using religion, not using the argument from authority at all. And uh, the, the, the other thing I do a lot is I write now in my current role as a journalist, I write a lot and expose the uh, hypocrisy of, uh, you know, CEOs of Maori Stopes, I've been writing about this over the last year or so, uh, who have been given plum five, you know, figure salaries. And the more babies they kill, uh, the more incentives some of these doctors, etc., get. Um, uh, yeah, so, so the, these are some of the ways we've been uh, for, fighting abortion and, and the pro-life movement thank god is growing by leaps and bounds every day it's interesting to me that many, many organizations that people would expect to be apolitical are, are anything but in, the, in this area i'm thinking yeah. of, of, of one that i belong to as a young man but no longer do and if i did belong i'd have resigned um the national secular society i yeah. mean they are real blowers of the trumpet for um for for abortion they just can't get enough of them it's, um, I mean, it, and it just seems to me that, that such organizations, they are always taken over by the left, always. Yeah, absolutely, yes. yes if, if, you, uh, if your stated goal is uh, to remove religion from, you know, get the 26 bishops out of the House of Lords, for example, I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, why are you waving the abortion flag on which boats religious and non-religious people can have you know very very strong views it's not particularly a religious matter so so why now that's a very good point mike yeah and also i think i mentioned just before we started recording jules that i went to catholic boarding schools in fact all boy boarding schools from 7 to 16. very very happy years and i've no doubt that's where i got my moral compass so 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 when i see the national secular society campaigning relentlessly against faith schools i think that is I, I i i wouldn't have said this as a young man but but now i see that as quite evil what they're doing i mean wh- where else is morality to be taught precisely and that's where we come back to your question about western civilization hmm. w- w- what's the framework what's the fabric that holds us together there's none Unfortunately not, no. It would be lovely if, you know, liberal philosophy could do the job, but it doesn't seem to enter people's hearts and souls in the way that religion can. Um, And I kind of, I wonder whether that's because it's not taught properly, because, you know, I am very keen on the United States as a country founded on liberal philosophy Mm -hmm. and Bill of Rights is the most beautiful and pure expression mm. of liberal philosophy that's ever been 
put into text. Um, you know, but I had to find liberalism and, you know, the kind of truth and the beauty in that myself. I was raised, you know, with my schooling and the media and my, you know, friends and family um, and non-governmental organizations, charities, everyone telling me that the West is an oppressive patriarchy and capitalism's really bad, you know, and mm. we're destroying the planet and all of this. So, you know, maybe if we raise children to be grateful because we're so lucky to be living, you know, in the best time and place mm. in That's history. About. Yes. It's most wonderful. But they're not taught that. Absolutely. I think the problem with liberalism, and I would consider myself a good old fashioned liberal mm. uh, and rejoice in its values. The problem with liberalism is that, and, and, and liberal scholars themselves admit it, uh, it took the, the enlightenment, took the best of Christian morality, but rejected the Christian God. And Nietzsche warned that in time to come, this would not sustain Western civilization for very long. Mm -hmm. uh, because why do you ultimately believe in a particular moral law if there is no ultimate moral give, law given? Yeah. So this was one of the uh, kind of the grave diggers hypothesis, as it were, uh, how the West destroyed itself. Uh, the, the, the other thing, of course, is what you mentioned about the United States, and I'm greatly in love with the United States. I've been in love with the United States ever since I myself got out, there, got out of this rotten uh, leftist mindset. Uh, you know, once upon a time, I believe that, you know, <laughs> wealth should be redistributed and we were oppressing the poor, etc., etc., and capitalism was a bad thing. Uh, but uh, the more I, I looked at reality, the more I realized I was so stupid. You know, I didn't know the first thing about e economics, even though I studied economics and I was pontificating uh, on, on something that was profoundly wrong. But the, the, the great thing about the United States is that the Bill of Rights and the Constitution is based on the, the Judeo-Christian scriptures mm -hmm. and the founding fathers, they may not all have been what we would call practicing Christians. Some of them were like Thomas uh, Jefferson were deists. Nevertheless, they held to the principles of the theological and philosophical principles of uh, the, the Jewish and the Hebrew, the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures. So, so, so the, the whole idea, which I, I rejoice in, our rights do not come from the government, like the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, they come from the creator. And, uh, uh, and you can see why uh, Americans are so passionate about standing for their rights, whereas we living in many parts of Europe, particularly in Britain, I must say, are so content to give up our rights and say, okay, if the government tells me to do this, I'll do this. If the government doesn't tell me to do this, I will do it. <laughs> Absolutely. And finally, I wonder whether you have any advice for men living in an aborting culture. Well, yes, I do. Uh, my biggest advice to men is don't let feminists intimidate you by telling you don't have telling you that you don't have a voice because you don't have a uterus. Uh, women will tell you it's a woman's issue. It's not a woman's issue because the unborn child is not her body. It's another body. I don't care what you do with your body, you know, go and get tattoos or, you know, amputate your left arm and right leg. I don't care. But the child in your womb is not your body. That's a biological and a scientific fact. Moreover, don't let men, uh, feminists intimidate you because uh, the, the, the child in the woman's womb is not her own creation. It had to involve the sperm of a man. Uh, uh, feminists will try to shout you down, saying you don't have a uterus, you don't support women's rights because you are, you're, not, you're not pro choice. Well, 
I support the right of a girl not to be killed in the womb. I strongly support women's rights. Uh, in fact, I support even more, I am pro-choice in the sense, I want women to have even more choices. I would also like to see the baby being offered a choice, the right to life, particularly if that baby is a female child. I'm more pro-choice, uh, you, know, you have the choice of abstinence from sex, you have the choice of adoption, if you get pregnant and don't want the child, you have the choice of carrying the baby to full-term pregnancy and giving birth to it, and you have the choice of contraception. Uh, I'm just not pro-murder, which is the fifth choice. I'm not pro-killing an innocent human being. So uh, d d don't let the, the feminists tell you it's my body. It's not your body. And no one who is pro-life is telling women what to do with her body or with other choices. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Men should not speak on this issue. This is kind of an ad hominem argument. Uh, arguments, I'm making my argument for life. I'm making my argument against abortion. It's an argument. I'm making it on scientific and philosophical grounds. Arguments, my dear friends, do not have genders. Only people do. <laughs> Jules, I wonder if we might ask just one final question that's that's occurred to me. Um, we, we, we're okay for time. Um, now, which way? Always, always get that wrong. Um, you, you'll see on the list of men's issues that that that, mm. that starts with with abortion. Uh, the second issue is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, that is that is. I mean, obviously, that's to do with women drinking alcohol during pregnancy. It is the number one cause of avoidable mental incapacitation in the Western world and, and has been. There was a bit of fuss recently when uh, I think there's some guidance to GPs that they should record when, when women are drinking alcohol during, during pregnancy. Um, I, I, you know, I just wonder if you, if you have any thought. I, you know, I, I, I mean, the, the, the position in the uh, manifesto of Justice Men and Boys um, basically, it's that the state should recognise that drinking alcohol during pregnancy, whilst knowing you know you're pregnant, is is by is is grievous bodily harm. Oh my goodness, that that's that you, you know uh, the, the the response of a feminist to that would be again, it's my body. Don't tell me what to do. Uh, but the, the irony, and the, 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 there are delectable ironies and double standards everywhere here mm. in the feminist position. Uh, so on the one hand, the, the leftist nanny state will tell people don't smoke. Uh, the NHS runs campaign after campaign saying smoking will damage your baby. Uh, interestingly, Elizabeth, uh, <laughs> we come back to what we talked about images, uh, they are prepared to show images about uh, how, and you can see it on all cigarette packets now, on how terrible, you know, oh my goodness, uh, smoking destroys your testicles, <laughs> you know, and they show pictures of some poor bloke in some part of the world uh, with damaged testicles because of cigarette smoking. So they're happy with smoke, uh, showing images when it suits them. They will also show images of children, babies in the womb, being affected by the mother smoking or secondhand smoke, as they call it. Now, that's very interesting. Mm. That is very interesting. You, you, yeah, you, you, you believe. And, and there are academic books written on this, medical textbooks written on this, of course. 